Um, and, and he'll pause as well to, uh, to let people catch up with questions. So um, if you put your chat function on and use that, that'd be great. Okay, over to you, Andy. Thank you very much. Now, last week I did something wrong with the sound and I want to make sure I do the sound right this week. But uh, oh, bear with me. Oh, this thing's in my way. <laughs> I, I can't see the sound thing, so it's really annoying because last week apparently you couldn't hear the, the bird calls all that well. And during the week I worked out how to do this. And now I can't see the button, I have to wait. We can see your presentation. Yeah, I don't think we're going to hear the sound overly well. But we worked out how to do this the other day. And now... Oh, bear with me. Sorry, everybody. How do I get out of here? I'm just going to crack on, I think, because uh, I don't know. Right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for, for coming back. The people who were here last week and all the new people, welcome. There might be a slight bit of repetition from last week, so I apologise for that, but hopefully not, not too much. So last week we had, not last week, two weeks ago, time has flown, we had uh, early spring. This is now wildlife as spring progresses. So I said this is, as Jeremy said, this is the second of uh, these fortnightly Zoom meetings. So we'll have the third one on the 15th of April and the fourth one on the 29th of April. So I think I said weeks ago that spring is my favourite time of year and I haven't changed my opinion on that. It's still my favourite. Uh, again, new life, warmer days. We've even got more daylight now because uh, the clocks went forward on Saturday night, Sunday morning. So we've got an extra hour of light in the evening. So particularly thank, thank you everyone coming along this evening because when we did this two weeks ago, it was dark outside and there was nothing to do. Now if you're anywhere we want in Wales and the sun's shining, well, it's fine and shining and it's daylight, but you're here. So thank you very much. And uh, now there's all sorts of new things to see and it's, it's all great. So we're gonna talk a little bit about them. So uh, hopefully now the threat of, well, I wrote this, threat of snow is behind us, but I've heard there's possibly going to be a bit of snow over the weekend, but hopefully not. But uh, I think it was Wednesday, Thursday this week, it was like summer. So we, I was a bit worried we'd skipped spring and gone straight on to summer, but we're kind of back to spring now. Uh, so we've got a whole host of new arrivals will arrived in the last, last couple of weeks. And there's loads more to follow, which we're going to talk about in future weeks. So last week we looked at uh, and breeding amphibians. We looked at frogs and toads, but this week we're going to look at newts and then the next wave of spring migrants. Then there's going to be song returning to the uplands. Look at who may have emerged from hibernation and some early spring flowers. Here we go. And uh, as Gemma said, uh, we very much welcome your questions and there's the chat box. So just type them in as you go along. I know some people last week were emailing me the next day saying they didn't have enough time at the end to, uh, to get their questions in. So I'm gonna try and leave a bit more time at the end this evening. I'm trying not to waffle on too much. So you've all got a chance to, to ask, you, ask your questions. And again, nothing, nothing too difficult. I think there was a question about ring oozel habitats last week, which challenged me a bit. So, uh, but all good for that. Nothing too tricky. Uh, so here in Gwent, we have our five native amphibians. And I said last time we talked about frogs and toads, but we also have three species of newt here in, uh, here in Gwent. We have the great crested newt, the palmate newt, and the smooth or common newt. So this here is a palmate newt. So the palmate and the smooth newt, they're quite, quite similar looking. But if you look at the, the back leg of this one, it's why they're called a palmate newt, because it kind of has the male when it's a webbed, a webbed back foot. And then right at the end of his tail, has this little filament. So that, that's how you tell sort of a palmate newt. 
but you can also, if you're very delicate, you can pick them up and flick them over and you can look at the throats. So there's differentials. So one of them's got hardly any spots on the throat and one has quite a spotty, spotty throat. But all these are quite, quite small, uh, the palmate and smooth newts. And if, if you happen to find a great crested newt, you'll, you'll know about it because they're, uh, they're a whopper in comparison. And if you look at it, they're an awful lot, awful lot darker. This is a great crested newt. And uh, another name for this is the warty newt. So particularly if you look at his head there, there's all sorts of little warts on his head. So uh, we're the sort of European protected, the great crested newt. But uh, we're fortunate here in Gwent to really have quite a lot of them. But uh, you need a special license to uh, pick them up and mess about with them and stuff. But I'm sure if you've got them in your pond, you can have a nice, nice look at them and uh, such things. Right, that was all quite quick, that. Uh, are there any questions on amphibians? Because I'm going to, while people are maybe thinking of questions, I want to make sure the sound's working. This is going to upset me. There's no questions yet, Andy, about amphibians. Right, I am going to quickly try and come out of this and make sure this sound works. Bear with me. Uh, I really don't know. Yes. Yeah, Someone's just mentioned there is a bit of a lag with the slides, Andy. Right. Right, how am I going to... Uh... This is frustrating. Right, we're going to crack on. Uh, people tell me if the sound doesn't work too well, but uh, sort of, uh, we talked last time how our summer visitors were just beginning to, to trickle in earlier in March. We talked about sort of wheat ears and sand martins and chip chaps, which hopefully some of you will have will have seen. Now they're generally the first ones to arrive, but since then there's a whole whole fresh lot of ones that have arrived. There's uh, sort of willow warblers, black caps, gold crests, swallows have now arrived. And as well as, I think of the birds migrating in, but April's the time for elvers to sort of migrate back up our rivers as well. Now, could everybody hear that willow warbler singing quite clearly? I don't know. Is this a frustrate? Could you hear it, Gemma? Yeah, I can hear it, yeah. But we haven't right. moved on on the slides. We're still on the... Uh great crusty newts at the moment. Right, I don't know why there's such a lag. This didn't happen last week. Uh, so we heard the sound, but we haven't got a willow warbler there. No, it's <laughs> very strange sound emanating from a newt at the moment. Right. It might be worth coming out and then resharing your screen, maybe. Uh, right, let's give this a go. Uh, right then, what have we got now? It's all a bit black at the moment is thinking about it. Yeah. yeah, I think there's definitely a delay this week. Right. This is all coming from Cardiff as well, where the broadband should be tip top. Oh, don't sing again. I like them singing. I was asked last week what my favourite bird song was, and I said a willow warbler, but I've heard it five times now. I've had enough. Yeah, we're still not getting anything. Okay. We got him. We're on a willow warbler. Yay, there we go. So, uh, so willow warbler, it's like... 
I was lucky enough to be out surveying in the hills yesterday and uh, I heard my first willow warble of the year and the, the bushes were following them. So I think the, the nice weather of the last few days has allowed them to have, these are all migrating up from, from down in Africa. So we looked at the chip chaff last week, which is very similar, uh, slightly shorter wing, a very different call uh, and, uh, and darker legs. But uh, as we were saying last week, the willow warbler has a uh, slightly longer wings. That means it migrates a lot further. So this will be all, this tiny bird will come all the way down from, all the way up from sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not quite sure when they actually set off back to us, but they're all arriving back, all arriving back now. Generally the males arriving first, sort of setting up territories. And uh, move on to the next. Has that moved on to the next one? Not yet. So we could all play a fun game. Did everyone hear the sound then? You could guess what the next slide's going to be. <laughs> the sound. That was a black cap singing, which is, uh, again, I think we discussed black caps last week because they were one of our winter visitors that was leaving us. But that was our winter visitors, our winter black caps going back to Germany. But now we've got the black caps coming up from maybe sort of Northern Africa and from Spain to, to join us. And these ones have arrived back and straight away there full of song and singing away. Hopefully you can see there why it's called a black cap. It's got a, a nice black cap on it. And another name for them is the Nightingale of the North. because They've got such a, such a nice song kind of thing. And uh, again, I think last week I said, a lot of my bird photographs seem to be the male ones, but for sexual equality, we're gonna have a black cap, which doesn't have a black cap, which is a female black cap, which is as, a, as the brown cap. And we've got a lot of these migrating birds. It tends to be the male one arrives maybe a couple of weeks before the, before the female one. So all the male black caps will be arriving about now, setting up their territories, and then the female ones arrive and they all, they all get together and, and have their babies, which is great. We're still not on black cap. We just went backwards, I think. Well, we can't have gone backwards. <laughs> Then we went back forwards again. What what are we on now? Are we on a female black cap? Not yet. We're still on the, the willow warbler. Right. I wonder if my daughter's doing some incredible video making. I'm gonna tell her to. <laughs> I'll be back in a second. Apologies, everybody. Usual Zoom issues. There we go. I've told my daughter to cease and desist for 40 minutes. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that will make a difference. Right. What are we on now? Still on the warbler. <laughs> oh, that. I was desperate for that warbler to appear. And now it has appeared. I want it to clear off. Black cap singing again. I wonder if it's the sound files, Andy. Right. Mm. Then I had the sound files on last week and it seemed to work okay, but I don't know. Well, this one hasn't got a sound file on this one. Sorry, everybody. Let me try. Shut of that. Shut of that. Shut of that. Shut of that. Right. I've got every confidence.
this is gonna work now. I'm not allowed to swear, am I? <laughs> no. Please okay. don't swear. No, I won't swear. I don't know any bad words. I wonder if I should come entirely at the meeting and then let me back in again. I don't know. Yeah, maybe try that then. Okay, I'm going to do that. Goodbye, everybody. Well, I'll just wait for him to rejoin and fingers crossed. Okay, here he comes. Hello again. Hello there. I was tempted not to come back. I was going to go out for a walk and leave you all to it. But uh, now, could you? I've had my screen sharing disabled. Could you Hang on. give me permissions, please? There we are. Thank you very much. Can everyone see a gold crest? Yay! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I had a thumbs up there from in the crowd. Right. Yeah. So, so gold crest, they're not a sort of as big a I'm talking over the Goldcrest. I'm sorry, Mr. Goldcrest. But uh, a lot of our migrants come all the way up from Africa, but our, our Goldcrests don't migrate, don't make don't migrate quite as much. They're tiny little things. But uh, there is migrations of every autumn and every every spring, sort of because they they have to sort of they're tiny little things. And in a in a really harsh winter, you can get a huge percentage of the population of the the UK's smallest smallest bird alongside the fire crest and in a, in a harsh winter huge number of these sadly sadly die I did promise I was going to talk about things dying last week so I talked about a dead headshot last week and then I regretted that afterwards but uh this one is all very nice and alive so again you will have these moving through at the moment and you can see why it gets its name the gold crest and uh I used to do a lot of bird ringing and on the male ones you could tell the male from the female because you blow gently on top of their head and the actual Underneath the yellow on the head is all orange in the male one. And they're very cute little things and uh, so high pitched that generally the older generations can't actually hear them anymore. And uh, I know my dad used to not believe, I'd say there's a gold crest and he wouldn't believe it existed unless he heard it. But uh, thankfully I can still, I can still just about, just about hear them. But they are incredibly, incredibly high pitched. There's a, there's a swallow singing away, so that's a real a real sign of spring when the uh, when the swallows come. I haven't actually seen one myself yet, but I know I know lots have been seen in the last in the last weeks. Again, on this good weather, they've been uh, migrating up, and they're one of the one of the few birds that actually make migrate during the day. Because most of our birds migrate overnight, and we don't really see them migrate. But because swallows can feed on the wing, then they can sort of migrate and have their lunch at the have their lunch at the same time so you'll quite often see them particularly sort of maybe down on the on the levels there'll be a accumulation of them sort of eat 
reaching reaching landfall and feeding and then dispersing off dispersing off inland and that the sharp eared among you may have heard i think a pied pied wagtail and a chaffinch in amongst all that song as well uh and there we go we talked about some birds migrating but it isn't just birds that birds that migrate uh our eels migrate as well and they have a a far more like the migration of our birds is incredible but i think the eel is even more incredible really so our eels will spend between about five and 25 years in our rivers and ponds and then all of a sudden some urge comes across them and they suddenly decide right we're going to swim back down the river out out the sea right the way across the atlantic almost over to the west indies the sargasso sea where there's there's nothing there it's just see of nothingness really but that's some reason i don't know why they don't just think i'm just going to go and breed down in the seven estuary save all the hassle but they swim like thousands of miles all the way across the all the way across the sargasso sea and then they'll breed oh, i'm going to talk about things dying again they breed and then they die and then and then it takes one to three years for their tiny little young to make it all the way back to our rivers again it seems that uh, an awful lot of hassle to be honest so they they'll start off in the sagasso sea as a leptocephala they're called which i think means leaf head i think the tiny little thing and then they'll they can't really swim but the the gulf stream carries them across the atlantic atlantic ocean and then when they get to the continental shelf they start to become more like eels become sort of glass eels they're still see-through and by the time they enter like the seven estuary and start coming up our rivers then they they've turned into elvers and from April, April into May time, it's the time the elves come up our rivers. And historically, particularly that the Seven and up the Y was a huge elver fishery. And uh, you know there would be loads of people out there fishing for them. But you may be aware that their numbers have dropped hugely in recent years. I think it's about a ninety percent drop in in elver numbers returning to our returning to our rivers. So a real a real cause of concern. And uh, some of this could be due to pollution, but I think something that migrates that far, all it takes is maybe the Gulf Stream to move slightly. There's all sorts of different things sort of not helping them. And then they have to pass up our rivers as well. And there's, you know, we have put all sorts of artificial blockages in weirs and dams and stuff, but people are putting in eel passes now and, you know, to try and help them get back up, back up to where they are. So I don't know what the future is for the eel. I think there's, I think some people said there's a real possibility it could face extinction which is which is a bit mad really something which is such a familiar and well-known and previously hugely common species right any questions i'll mute myself yes we've got a couple actually and i should have asked one earlier right um, okay. while we were waiting for slides so it's back on the um on the newts um so someone's asked is it normal to see baby newts already because they have yeah. some well, it's interesting to say that because someone had posted on our gwent wildlife spotting page today i'll do a plug for that if anyone hasn't signed up for that that's, that's on facebook but i saw someone had posted on there today and they had adult newts with tiny little tiny little baby newts next to them and i i'd be i wouldn't think they were this year's that would be very early breeding to have them that size already but potentially they could be this year's but i know sort of tadpoles in my pond most of them develop into little froglets that year, but there always seems to be a few that don't develop in the first year and they they stay sort of as young over winter and and are still babies the next year. So I suspect I could be wrong, they may be a few of last year's which didn't didn't metamorphosize last summer and but probably will do will do this year. And uh and last week, I think I was on about the frogs. It's a bit of an aside, but the frogs in my ponds, I said, I used to have hundreds of frogs. And then last year there was none. And this year there wasn't any at all. But since last week, like a soap opera, for this, an update on it. I had some frog spawn. So it was very late, but I had two clumps of frog spawn. So I thought I thought my frog population become extinct, but I think they're just hanging on. So so hopefully they'll produce lots of tadpoles and that'll that'll boost the population again. So, I was saying I suspect that I had some one of these uh, sort of amphibian diseases in my garden, but hopefully there's a few frogs which were 
immune to it and they'll be the ones that will hopefully have sort of offspring which are and population will will kick off again right next question please and so we're back on the birds now so someone's asked we have um, a wren nesting in our swallows nest from last year yeah. do you think the wrens will have left the nest before the swallows return right well the swallows could be back any day now so i suspect the wrens won't be out of there but the swallow is quite capable of making a new nest it may not even come back to the same nest. it might make a new nest anyway so I, I doubt i think some birds would come back and kick the other ones out and say oi this is mine you but i'd imagine the swallows hopefully come back and they'll just make another nest another nest nearby so everyone will be happy but wrens quite often have like four or five nests because i think the male makes four or five nests and then the female decides which one she likes the best and they go with that so it may even be one that the the wrens don't actually breed in it's one of his sort of trial nests the lady the lady wren to choose from great that's it for the moment righty ho now we're gonna sort of talk about migration of things coming huge distances but we also have my migrations sort of more locally on a more a more subtle level so if you're up on the up on the hills in the spring and summer there's all sorts of little birds going about but you go up there in the winter and there's maybe like a lone raven or something so we have these sort of more subtle movements of the smaller birds that just can't they can't survive in the uplands in the winter because there's snow there's no insects about and if you're small you lose heat quickly so some of them will migrate you know will migrate like the wheat ears they'll have gone down to africa but some of them like our stone chats for example they maybe just migrate down to the coast for the winter so then in the in sort of springtime they just move back up in the back up in the hills again so uh it's things like skylarks and meadow pipits and stone chats and limits and snipe and the like so hopefully this is gonna work It was a lovely skylark song there hopefully you all you all heard I and mean, i was like i had six hours of that ringing in my ears yesterday and it could have got on my nerves but i think i wasn't tired of it after six hours so it's a nice nice companion when i was working on the left here we've got the meadow pipit so if you're sort of out walking in the uplands and there's a little a little brown bird it's probably 99 percent sure well 90 percent sure it's probably a probably a meadow pipit there's just there they're everywhere and and then on the right, you have the skylark, which again is quite similar. And both of them do, you can maybe get the meadow pip and the skylark confused because both of them do fly up into the air and they both do sing while they're while they're flying, but they have they have quite different songs. But the, the skylark tends to go a lot higher, it just goes up and up and up until it's a tiny little, tiny little spot in the sky, whereas the, the meadow pip it just goes up a little bit and then kind of parachutes down. The first thing calling now was that there's a stone chat and they get their name from if you bang two stones together that sort of sounds like their call so when i was when i was a young boy I used to quite often just sit out in the hills talking to the stone chats i'd bang stones together and they'd and they'd sort of talk back to me i thought they were talking nicely back to me. they were probably actually saying clear off we think you're a rival and will you just stop annoying us to be honest but there we go and then on there on the right here we have the, the linnet, which uh, but both these birds are sort of really like favourite of areas of gorse. And I know some people don't don't like gorse and they think, oh, it's sort of invading bits of the uplands and they try and burn bits off and cut it down. But really you need to have patches of gorse, nice mosaic of stuff in the uplands for these birds to for these birds to nest in. So I think uh, I think in Manx Gaelic, so I'm from the Isle of Man, I think I think they're the Manx Gaelic no, name for a for a stone chat, I can't remember. It basically means point of the gorse because they're always just just perched on top. And I particularly like these kind of birds because they 
other birds lurk down in the undergrowth and you can't get a nice photograph of them, but these tend to sit right on the top there and just there, uh, sort of show off really. So both very nice things. And I guess these, these will have been sort of more down on the coast, but they're all back. Again, there was there were stone chats up on the up on the hillside. I was on yesterday and Linnets. So they're all they're all back up there now. So if you're going for a walk in the hills, because we can get out more and do that, then all these birds are back up there and singing away. Hopefully. You can hear a bit of a strange noise there, a bit like a sheep bleating, but that's uh, that's like the display noise. I say noise, but it's not a call or a song of the snipe because uh, they don't. It's not a, it's not a vocalization. They sort of fly high up, and then they've got special little side feathers to their tail, and then they plummet down the sky, and that's the noise of the of the feathers sort of going through the air. Really makes this a uh, called uh, drumming, but uh, makes that noise. And that's uh, sadly quite a rare sight, quite a, quite a rare sound in our uplands now. There's not many, there's not many places left with breeding snipe. It was uh, a bit sad, it's it. The numbers are sort of falling all across, the, all across the country really, but a lot of it's draining of marshy areas for agricultural improvement and all that kind of stuff. But there are, there are still, there are still snipe. I think it was last year I was out this time of year and there was up above Line Ave and there was uh, at dusk there was snipe drumming away so that's quite a magical sound really if you go up in the hills and sort of hear that uh you can see an enormous bill on it which is uh jamming right down into the mud and getting all the getting all the worms out and uh as well i, want, I was talking about migration into the uplands but as we're on the subject of uplands if uh, if you're out in the uplands this time of year Particularly a nice thing to look out for is the emperor moth. That one there is a bit tatty. That's on its last legs, but a spectacular moth. And this is a, a male, one of the big feathery antenna. But you can buy a, you can buy a little pheromone thing because uh, when the female comes out of her, out of her chrysalis, she generally sits there and emits this pheromone, and the the male one go absolutely absolutely mad for it. And you can uh, you can buy these little pheromones and go for a walk on the hills, and all the moths will come flying in. And I think two years ago I took a pheromone out onto the Blorange, and I was getting uh, getting bombarded by them. And then I I had that in the car, and I put the put the pheromone. You have to, have to store it in the freezer. And I hadn't had the pheromone in the car for four weeks. And I went down to Kenfig, and I parked up my car in Kenfig. And before I could even get out of the car, it was male emperor moths trying to trying to get in the car with me. And it just, they must be absolutely incredible how they can detect this. I've said this hadn't been in my, this pheromone hadn't been in my car for four weeks and they could instantly detect it and uh, were trying to get in and give me a kiss or something. But uh, spectacular moths ends there. Probably over the next month, that's when they're gonna be out and about on the hillside. So they're well worth, well worth looking for. And also this time yeah, there's quite a few hairy caterpillars sort of emerge from emerge from hibernation. This is a, a fox moth caterpillar. So they they hibernate as a fully grown, fully grown caterpillar. And then this time of year they come out, they, they don't actually feed at all. They just come out and they sunbathe for a few weeks. I don't know why they don't go into chrysalis in the autumn really, but they come out, they don't feed, they have a bit of a sunbathe. And then uh oh right and then uh and then they'll go into their chrysalis and then the fox moths, the adults will be out probably May into June. Now, as we're talking about uplands, I'm afraid we've got Skylark again, but there we go. Uh, it's competition time, as I mentioned last week. Uh, and uh, since then, we've all got a bit more, I say like two weeks ago, since then we've got a lot more freedom now. So we've got uh, our uplands photography competition, which finishes on the 31st of May. So we want people to go out, take Look, we've got loads of uplands in, in Gwent, loads, loads of places to go and a lot more freedom to go there now. So if people want to go out and uh, take photographs and enter into the competition. It can be, can be anything, it could be landscape, could be, you know, different. That's a lovely shot here by uh, one of our volunteers, Jane Corey, this is a silent valley, all the bluebells there. It's probably May time, you could go up and see, 
see this in our reserve. So anyone who wants to go out and take photographs, please, please enter. We'd love to love to see them all. Right, that was the uplands. Any questions on that? Yeah, we got a few questions on moths. Righty ho. Uh, so someone saw a hummingbird hawk moth today, uh, today, they said, and they they were just asking about whether it'll cope with the cold weather that's coming next week. Well, I'd imagine, I could be right, I imagine that one may well have migrated up with this real nice warm weather, but they think in the last few years, some of them have actually managed to hibernate in the UK because there was there's been some seen this year in February, I think, and there's no way they think that they've migrated up that time of year. So they must have actually managed to hibernate here. So I would imagine if they can survive hibernating here, if there's a bit of cold weather, they'll just go into torpor for a little bit. Yeah, they'll just find somewhere somewhere sheltered and then on the next next warm day they'll be back out again so i think i think they'll be fine that's good to know um someone's just remarking our uh, having seen a poplar hawk moth land on their tent and how enormous it was yes hawk moths are, it tends to be the moth that excites everybody as a hawk moth because it's they're all big and colorful and stuff and uh you'd imagine if you're camping and maybe you've got your light on in your tent then as we know like most moths are attracted to light so yeah come and come and land on your tent and there uh, and this is time of year when people could maybe get their moth traps out and even even if you just have a porch light you can sort of just leave that on and see what flies in as long as you make sure you catch them and hoik them back out again in the morning kind of thing but it's uh you'll be amazed at everyone's garden however small it is that i've, I've probably had you know, 250 different species in my garden and it's my garden's nothing remarkable at all so if you, if you just put a, a light out at night you'll get all sorts of stuff coming in it's not quite the time of year for hawk moths yet I'm sort of more into june apart from the hummingbird hawk moth that someone saw the other day yeah and then um someone's just asking about moth trapping at our nature reserves um right so yeah, I mean, if someone if someone would like to, that'd be great if they could get in touch. We have had uh, moth trapping going on um, by the, the infamous Roger James and, and Martin Anthony, who've got lots of records, which is great. But um, yeah, do get in touch with, with Andy. Yeah. And uh, the hillside I was working on yesterday, I won't say which hillside, but uh, the people we're working for, they were asking if, if we'd be able to do some moth trapping. And... Uh, so if anyone is keen into moth trapping and they'd like to basically we can give them access to that hillside and uh and they could go and sort of add, add to our records up there kind of thing it's quite a hike to get up there mind <laughs> i wouldn't recommend taking a moth trap up there i don't want to put people off but yeah certainly if people want to trap in our reserves yeah we love to have all the records and certainly in previous years we've had various after dark events we've had mega after dark where uh i think it was late June, early July, you know, one of our events, people can come along and join us. We put out a moth trap, we see what, see what we catch, and then we go and have a walk around the reserve with our bat detectors and look at the glow worms as well. So whether we'll be having such events this year, I don't know, but we certainly will in, in future years. So yeah, we'd like to do that. And obviously people can come along and see what we catch. There we go. That's it for the moment. Right, yo, thank you. Now we looked at what had emerged from hibernation last time uh, and we talked about sort of frogs and toads coming out and uh, but now we're going to look at uh, some other things that may have come out in the last few weeks. So our, our door mice, incredibly lazy, they're probably all still going to be fast asleep but our hedgehogs should be out now and uh, last time we talked about reptiles coming out and there'll be, there'll be more reptiles coming out and uh, also there'll be we looked at various butterflies last time. So there was like five species of butterfly which hibernate as an adult. Uh, which I'm gonna go through again. Small tortoiseshell, red admiral, peacock, brimstone and comma. I think we were out for a walk the other day. I think we saw all of them. But now there's some of the butterflies which actually hibernated as pupa are actually on the wing now. So we're gonna have a, a bit of a look at all of that. Uh, so here we go. I talked about a dead hedgehog last week. This week, we're going to forget about the dead hedgehog. And I'm going to stop mentioning it. And this is a lovely live one. So uh, they'll all just be coming out of, out of hibernation now. So this one was actually on January the 1st. It shouldn't have been out of hibernation then. But hopefully it managed to get 
back into hibernation because they a lot of these animals which hibernate do occasionally wake up during the winter if there's a bit of a, a mild spell and they'll have a little bite to eat and then go back to back to sleep again but really our our hedgehogs probably all should be up and up and awake now and snuffling around our gardens and i know we've had various reports of people saying they've that they've seen the hedgehog so it, it's always nice to know that a hedgehog's made it through the winter because they have to be a certain weight sort of to get through so all the ones that are waking up now they've they obviously fed well last autumn and they're all ready now to to carry on with their life which is which is great. i'd love to squeeze the nose of that one just as an aside uh, and then we talked about i think it was adders we mentioned last week and uh i can i can see sue there now hello sue uh <laughs> <laughs> no one else can see that but i can but this week it's a slow worm that isn't a snake that's uh that's all okay uh so it looks like a snake but it's uh it, it's a it's a lizard so it doesn't have any legs so that they're all sort of out of out of hibernation now and they'll be uh just basking in our gardens and i think i think i was saying i might have been saying less but you know it's 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 good to have them in your garden some people maybe don't like them, but they'll eat all these slugs for you. So it's it's the gardener's friend, and I think they're quite quite adorable things. And then now you won't see these now, but this is all part of a story. So this is this is an orange tip butterfly caterpillar, and uh, we we went and caught three of them last year, and uh, we sort of looked after them. They didn't really need looking after, but we looked after them anyway. And then they formed these. Uh, of intricate chrysalises and you can i love the fact you can actually see the, the butterfly's wing inside the chrysalis you can even see the tiny little bit of silk thread sort of girdle which holds it in place there and it's all superb design but you can see the wing on that it's been a no time you know been two weeks of it probably forming that chrysalis which was last july i think and it just sat there sort of just i don't know if they're bored in there it, I don't know what they're thinking in there, kind of thinking, oh, come on, springtime. But last week, all three of them uh, all three of them hatched out into, into adult orange tips. And just a thing about the caterpillars as well. Uh, most caterpillars just like eating leaves and stuff. But the and uh, again, the, the orange tip caterpillar does like eating leaves and seed pods, but they are cannibalistic when they get a bit older. So I have to keep the three caterpillars apart, otherwise that had just been one very, very big caterpillar, but I kept them apart. So, so then they hatched out and this is, this is what you get. So this is a orange tip butterfly. It's one of our, one of our white butterflies, but a bit more exciting than our other white butterflies because it has this lovely splash of orange, at least the male one does. And then their underwings as well. You can see on the right hand side, I love the patterns underneath. It's like, it can look all gaudy and flashing its orange. And then when it wants to, it can just close its wings and then just sort of, disappears with this sort of camouflage. I love the, love the furriness of it as well. So these are, I said they spent the win winter as a chrysalis, but they're just coming on the wing now. And then another one which spent the winter as a chrysalis is, uh, is the holly blue. So you may be more familiar with the common blue butterfly, but if you see a, a blue butterfly this time of year, it'll definitely be a holly blue because the common blues probably aren't out until late April, early May. So it's a holly blue and it's called a holly blue because it's caterpillars eat holly but they have two broods a year so this one any ones that are on the wing now would have been a caterpillar last autumn and the ones that are caterpillars in the autumn only eat ivy and then the ones that are caterpillars in the spring only eat holly so it's just a demonstration really that if you want lots of different invertebrate species in your garden you have to have lots of different species. If you just had holly in your garden or you just had ivy, you don't get a holly blue. It just shows it sort of complicated lifestyles they lead and, and how we have to sort of wildlife, garden friendly kind of thing to make sure all these things, all these things survive. So one of my favorite butterflies out and there. Uh, I get them here in my garden in Cardiff and you may well get them in, in your garden as well. But yeah, you've got to, you can't cut down all the ivy because they, uh, they need it. And uh, as well as talking about butterflies, there's lots of moths as well. And there will actually be moths probably flying about your garden all throughout the winter. There's a, there's a moth called the winter moth, which is capable of flying in really low temperatures. But just this, around about this time of year is when 
a lot more moths get active. So uh, there's actually a website uh, which is called What's Flying Tonight? It's part of Butterfly Conservation. And if you type in the date and where you live, it then pulls out all the species that are likely to be flying at that time of year in your location kind of thing. So it's a really useful thing. If you're wanting to identify them, there's thousands of different moth species, literally, but this can help really narrow it down. So uh, got a little selection here of what's probably in your garden this time of year. So we've got an early gray in the top left and then an early thorn, uh, which is fairly unusual for moths, holding its wings up more like a butterfly. Then at the top right, we have a Hebrew character, which is named because it has a the little symbol on its wing, looks like a Hebrew character. And then in the bottom right is a, a common Quaker, which has just come out of its chrysalis. That's another one we reared. And then in the middle at the bottom is a brindle beauty, which I think it's quite nice to be called a beauty. And that contrasts with the one on the bottom left, which is a, a lead colored drab, which I feel really sorry for. Poor thing being called a, called a drab. There we go. So all of these are probably flying around your garden this evening. So if you get a moth trap, you can catch them all and have a good, a good look at them. Right, any questions on that, please? Just, um, just on the moths there, someone's really helpfully put a link to making your own moth trap for your garden, which is oh, great. Right. Yeah. Because um, uh, I moth trap and Andy moth traps and we often have a moth off. <laughs> um, because we love our moths. <laughs> oh, I there from someone as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, um, yeah, and, and then it's just underlining just how many moths there are, over two and, two and a half thousand species of UK moths. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then someone has asked, moving on to hedgehogs again, that they've, they've seen some hedgehogs in their garden. Lucky them to have hedgehogs in their garden. And they're just asking what the best thing to feed them um, is at this time of year. Right. I quite often think with these things, hopefully, if, if you've got a nice wildlife friendly garden, they may well find enough food for themselves and then they'll be, they'll be crunching on your snails and crunching on your slugs and you won't have to put down any kind of chemicals or anything to stop, to stop these things. It all should balance itself out nicely. But there is, I know traditionally it was all it was said to feed them bread and milk, but that's a very bad thing to feed them. That'll give them give them the runs. But you can buy you can buy purpose purpose made hedgehog food, which is a bit like kind of dry dog food, I think. So you can certainly certainly try that. I think that's that's approved. But quite often this time of year, I, I don't really put much food out for any of the wildlife in my garden this time of year. I kind of think it's springtime now, and they can they can find all the good natural food, but. There's no harm in giving them a bit of, bit of extra, so I'd probably go for the sort of purpose, purpose formulated hedgehog food. I think that's been especially made to have the right nutrients in and, and the like. Right, I can see I'm running short on time again. So there we go. Yeah, someone said about checking out Ark Wildlife for some good um, hedgehog food. Right, there we go. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be various things things online. Yeah, and someone asked about speckled woods, whether they overwinter as a chrysalis or not, because they've seen them in their garden this week. Yes, they do. Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the next ones. Out. If, if they come back in two weeks time, there's a slide of a speckled wood. I'm going to talk about them more. But yes, they're just out as well. So they're another one that speckled, speckled woods have three or four broods throughout the year. So they, they really do. They breed a lot kind of thing. But the ones that are coming out now will have been chrysalises. And that's why they're out out early and they're, they're one of the butterfly species which has really thrived recently their numbers are hugely up a lot of them are sliding down but the speckled wood is a bit of a success story at the moment so there we go right early spring flowers so we, we looked at some spring flowers last week and these are a few more which are, are coming into bloom now so again the woodland's really the place this time of year because uh, a lot of them want to flower before the canopy of the of the, of the leaves coming out on the trees comes over so they tend to be earlier flowering in the woods and in our fields but there's, there's a bit of life in our fields as well cuckoo flowers and field wood brush and stuff coming out so here we're on the left we got wood anemone and on the right we have wood sorrel so they're both both attractive attractive ones particularly at the moment that the wood anemone is probably at its peak at the moment and in a couple a couple of weeks time it'll probably gone over and then the 
things like the bluebells are taken over more. And there's the wood sorrel here on the right, which people got leaves like a like clover really and gets overlooked a bit, but you can see it's yeah, really delicate little stripes on it, really nice little plant. And uh, and if you eat the leaves of it, it tastes just like uh, uh, apple skin, really nice. So uh, whenever I'm going to walk in the woods, I always have a little bit of uh, wood sorrel leaves, but they've got oxalic acid in them. And apparently too much of that makes you poorly. So don't, don't have a whole meal of them, but a little, a little snack as you're going along is all right. Oh, blimey. Now I was going to tell everyone we've got some poetry coming up now. <laughs> don't be alarmed if my voice changes slightly. So I've, I've, I've had RADA training and I can put on this special voice. Lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them dance, the day and the deep despite them rose and grew. The earth and the There we go, my lips didn't move once. And needless to say, I didn't write that. That was uh, William Wordsworth, as I'm sure you all know. And uh, so that's, uh, that's our native daffodil. There's actually lots of daffodils at the moment, but none are quite as nice as our, as our native one, which is uh, a lot more delicate. And, uh, and you can see on the right-hand side, this is our Margaret's Wood Reserve down at Whitebrook, which that's a photograph I took there last week. I can never do justice to it, really. It's just a whole field there full of full of daffodils and yeah you have to go really and uh i said they were looking spectacular last week and i'd imagine maybe for the next couple of weeks they'll still be looking great so if you get the opportunity pop down there there's probably only parking for one car but it's generally not too busy down there so i dare say if you go down there you'll be able to be able to have a look but it really is nice a nice nice bench in the middle of the orchard there as well with all the all the daffodils so it's a nice be a nice place to have a picnic Okay, and then uh, we've got a few more woodland flowers here. On the left here, not very spectacular, this is dog's mercury, which tends to get overlooked, but in quite a lot of our woods, it's probably just as common as the bluebells, carpet in huge areas, but that's as exciting as the flower gets. And then in the middle here, we have moscatel, which again is a tiny little thing and overlooked, but it's, it's quite a unique little flower. It's also called a town hall clock. So if you can imagine in a, in a village, village square, you've got the big, big sort of town hall clock on the tower with the clock face on each side. So all the way around, it's almost like a flower head's almost like a, a cube with four, four faces and then a, a fifth flower on the top. And then on the right hand side here, we have a, a violet. This is early dog violet, uh, which is probably out now. And then the common dog violet, which people might be more familiar with, looks very, very similar, probably out in the next few weeks. Now I have a whole slide here. I was going to take people through all the different violet identification, but I'm going to look at the time. There ain't much time, so I might not go into all this in detail. But uh, basically, if you want a bit of a challenge and you're out in the woods, there's, we have various different uh, violet species it could be in flower at the moment. We've got early dog violet, common dog violet, marsh violet, and sweet violet. So various things to look for. The marsh violet has a round leaf, all the others are heart-shaped leaves. And you can see in the top left hand corner, I've sort of marked the, the spur. That's the bit sticking out of the back of the flower. On the early dog violet, that spur will be darker than the, petal, than the petals. But on the common dog violet, it'll be lighter than the petals. And it also has a little notch in it. And then, then you can see the sepals there as well in the top left hand corner, pointed sepals. The common dog violet and the early dog violet have a pointed sepal, whereas the other ones have a blunt sepal. There's all these different things, but if you put them all together, you can uh, work out which violet you've got. And uh, the sweet violet as well, you can maybe forget all these tiny things and just have a smell of it, because the sweet violet's the only one that, only one that smells. But apparently there used to be a legend that you can only ever smell a sweet violet once in your life. 
but apparently that isn't strictly true, but it has a, has a chemical in its, in, its, in its odor that actually, uh, what's the word? Kind of deadens your smell receptors for about 20 minutes. So it's an old legend, but there is actually some, actually some truth in it. So you smell a sweet violet and it kind of deadens your, deadens your nose for a bit. But if you want a second smell, you can come back in 20 minutes and, and do it all again. And then uh, again, there's probably not much growing in our fields at the moment, but the cuckoo flower, which is what the, the caterpillars of the orange tip we saw earlier really love. They're all just coming into flower now. So cuckoo flower, name that because it sort of arrives in the flower at the same time as the cuckoo's calling. There's also called ladies smock and milkmaids, has loads of different names. And then on the right hand side, we have that field wood rush, also called that sweeps brush. You can imagine that scaled up as a the brush and this is tend to get this in in nice grasslands and it's just just popping its head up head up now uh and it has a name oh sent something i can't remember the name of it but basically it's called that name because it also they think it flowers on that day so whatever saints around about now is what it's named after which i forget uh, and that's that's some of the there's obviously lots more wildflowers back at the moment as well and lots more about to come out that's sort of a taste of what we can probably see see at the moment and now then I know most of you are members but if you're not a member and you'd like to join then please do because it helps us do talks like this care for our reserves campaign against things like the M4 do surveys for rare endangered species and educate children and adults alike and you get your magazines and all that so if you're not a member please become a member and uh, just to say we've got two more talks so hopefully you'll be back in two weeks time, 15th of April, and then again on the 29th of April. And I think that is, that's it, except for any more questions. We haven't got any more questions. There we go. No. Pointing, but it's one minute to eight, so that's not bad time. <laughs> so there we go. Apologies that it all went a bit bit wrong at the start but there we go hopefully it was all right after that please somebody nod and say it did there we go we've got some nodding heads there we go thank you just to shake the heads and say no we never got past the willow warbler but thank you andy and uh thanks to everyone for joining us uh yes, tonight and hopefully we'll see you again in a couple of weeks on the 15th of april there we go there'll be lots more will arrive before then and we'll uh we'll have a chat about it there we go. Right. All right. To everybody, and uh, see you in two weeks. Bye. Cheerio. Thank you. Hey. <laughs>